Let me welcome you. Welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a great guest with an incredibly important topic. We've been talking for years about the difficult, what some call the iron triangle of higher education. That is, how can we make higher education more affordable? Also, how can we improve its quality? And at the same time, how can we give more and more people more and more access to it? This is not an easy thing to figure out. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of difficulties in doing this. In fact, some call this, uh, you know, they echo this in terms of uh, uh, the old quality assurance thing uh, for our engineering. You can have something that's fast, that's high quality or cheap, but you can only pick two. Now, what's interesting here is that Steve Ehrman, a lifelong scholar, a lifelong activist, consultant, and worker in higher education, has put together uh, research showing schools that have managed to do all three of these at the same time. That he's been able to find campuses that have improved everything. They've improved quality and access and affordability all at the same time. Uh, it's remarkable. And this is an incredibly, incredibly important uh, set of discoveries. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, we can all learn from this. I'm just going to beam Janae Cohn right now on stage. Hello, Jeanne. You were, Hi. A, you were a great guest. I was really Thanks. Glad. <laughs> and um, nice to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Can you say more about your question about cool. um, what what you mean or, or, or how you're hoping to help us think through the iron triangle of quality access and affordability? So that's always the question uh, is, you know, how do we improve these three things? And one of the ways is to improve quality by making a campus less accessible and more expensive. And that's a pretty classic uh, way forward. Uh, and we also have the ability to make something more affordable, more accessible by reducing the academic quality. Uh, so a real, I'm just wondering where people have run into this dynamic in their own lives, in their own work. And I was picking on you in part because um, you were so smart and uh, because you've been thinking about all of this. Um, and since Stephen's coming back up, Janae, you do get to answer the question before, <laughs> before I boot you off. Oh, no. Well, I look forward to hearing Steve, the expert, thought on this. Um, I guess I'll just say that a, a tension I've noticed in quality, access, and affordability um, is in thinking about how you measure the components of these three kind of qualities, too, right? How are you measuring quality itself? And then to what extent does the measurement of quality impact the ways that we also measure access? Um, I think affordability is easy enough to measure, right? Um, right. That, 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 that's a pretty clear scale, but I think it gets hazier when we're thinking about, well, what does access really mean? Access to whom? Access for mm. what? Mm. And then, again, how does quality um, sort of change, or how does our perception of quality change when our definitions of access um, get either narrowed or broadened? So I don't have answers, just questions. So <laughs> I'll be interested in hearing um, Dr. Ehrman's thoughts on this as well. Thank you. Well, those are, those are great questions. Uh, thank you. Um, and. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go back to your whiteboard um, okay. and, and bring you back up in a bit. Um, uh, Steve, um, welcome back. Thank you. It was a really terrible computer crash. So I'm after sorry. a while, I gave up and I'm using my cell phone. I can, I can see it's a different angle than before. Um, but you sound good and, and your video quality is great. So welcome and thank you for your flexibility. Oh, I'm just sorry for the accident. So okay. repeat the question again. Is it about the... Well, I, I was I was asking everybody a question, um, but before I get to that question, I, I want to ask you just the, the personal question. Mm -hmm. I, I know you, you are somewhat somewhat retired, and yet you are producing a book and you're appearing to talk about this. So my, my question is, what are you up to for the next year? Are, are you going to be following this up with another book? Or are you going to be what else are you going to be up to besides um, uh, crashing computers? <laughs> well. Um, for people who aren't familiar with what I've been doing, I need to explain that a little bit in order to make any sense at all of what it is I'm going to be doing the next year. Um, I really got curious some years ago, and off and on maybe over 20 years, uh, about the question of how quality access and affordability uh, might relate to each other. And was it true that there was an iron triangle that uh, made it impossible to change all three at once? Yeah. Uh, so I started looking for institutions that um, had some evidence that they'd gathered that they had been making 
uh, improvements, at the very least in um, quality and accessibility. Um, and when I found my first one, I realized that um, by achieving uh, gains in quality and accessibility the way they had, they were also making gains in affordability, um, mm. wh whether the institution realized it or not. It was sort of mm. coming along in a couple of different ways with those first two achievements. Um, I started looking for more institutions. I felt that to have a book that was readable, um, I could do case histories, that is, the last 10 or 20 years of how each institution got to where it is today um, on five institutions. Uh, eventually, I had to um, settle for six because each one was shed such a different light uh, on the issues that were um, that we were tackling and um, what the possibilities were that they created. So um, over the next year, um, I'd really like to um, do case histories on another um, one to three institutions um, that are very different. Uh, from the six that I've profiled already. Um, mm. So, for example, I, uh, I profiled only one two-year institution, mm -hmm. but it's very unusual um, in both being very small and also very new. So uh, uh, a two-year college that's beginning to sense that they are, in fact, making progress in these directions, um, or at least wants to talk to me about um, how I would suggest they discover this, uh, that would be useful. Uh, I haven't looked at any traditional private institutions, and I'm thinking particularly of institutions that are not the, you know, the Ivy League most famous of the famous, because in general, the highest prestige institutions are not as motivated to make these kinds of changes as institutions a notch or two below that. That is, institutions with very capable people uh, promising activities, but without the reputation um, uh, that sort of would hold them rigid because everybody would revolt at any change that was being made and how it's always been done. Um, so whether that's uh, working with an institution uh, that's willing to answer a lot of questions or an institution that actually wants me to help out more substantively in trying to figure out where they are now and what next steps might be. Um, what I'm going to do with that, um, I don't know yet. It would depend on what it is I'm learning. Do I try to create a handbook? Do I try to create a second book with some additional case studies that, and um, uh, text about uh, you know, what, what the whole framework now looks like with, say, nine case histories behind it rather than six? Um, we'll just have to see what would develop. Well, I can't. I can't wait to see um, and to hear. And if uh, if we can help, let us know. Um, it would be really, really interesting to see. Um, so, uh, friends, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, uh, I'm just the moderator of the MC. I usually kick things off with another question, but then I get the heck out of the way and invite all of you to put forth your questions. So now that we have the author here um, and we have your his initial salvo of ideas. Uh, start thinking about what you'd like to ask him. For example, uh, what use of technology? Um, how can people use technology to try and solve that iron triangle? Or uh, what types of leadership uh, are best qualified or best positioned to lead that kind of transformation? Or just questions about how does this even work? This seems to violate some kind of physical law. Um, a, a question I'd like to I'd like to ask you to begin with, um, Stephen, uh, mm -hmm. is thinking about uh, the past year and a half of the pandemic, how did the pandemic hit this, these strategies? Did this force any of your model institutions to change their habits in a way that returned them to the earlier problems? Or were they able to persist uh, even through COVID-19? Um, I can say a little bit about that, but not much because the active research phase that, for this book was ending about the same time the pandemic was starting. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that the University of Central Florida, which has been making, is one of the two institutions that relies most on online and blended courses, um, has been trying to do that at scale um, for a very long time so that the, um, 
the way that they offer courses, the, what the skills that faculty have um, really pervade the institution. Um, a rough guess would be somewhere between half and two thirds of all of the full-time faculty have already had some kind of training, um, wow. not just in online, but in how you use uh, pedagogy, how you use basically the kind of same research-based insights yeah. into teaching and learning uh, that apply both to uh, online courses and as it happens in a different way to campus courses. And there had been um, a history already of faculty who had developed and taught online courses, then moving some of those pedagogical insights and some of those materials into campus courses too. So they had a much less of a hill to climb. Um, for example, there were uh, something like 60 or 70 people in their what I would call their teaching, learning, and technology center already, vastly bigger than most institutions have. I think you uh, you mentioned that UCF also has a very interesting funding model for how they fund their distance learning. It's a little different yeah. for us. Yeah, the state of Florida allows a distance learning fee to be assessed. Um, and I'm gonna get these numbers wrong probably, but as I recall, the state maximum is, uh, $14 a credit and UCF is change it, charging, I think about $9 a credit. But um, again, I'm gonna get this number a little wrong, but something like half of all their credits are coming from online courses. So this is a big revenue stream. If you think about um, students taking some courses, some degrees with mostly or entirely online courses, yeah, and they're trap. They're channeling. Um, I don't know whether it's most or all of that revenue back into making sure that this is a high quality, large scale operation. Right. That's really, really important. That closed loop there. You keep improving that, and they've been doing this since like two thousand or so. Um, uh, back into the late nineties, um, and I think they were really. Um, it says something about their principles as an institution that at the very time they were considering, do we offer online courses at all and what should they look like? The academic deans were agreeing that whatever they offered had to be really high quality um, and sort of a good fit with the campus, um, with campus offerings in terms of their effectiveness. So they were committed to um, subsidizing uh, faculty to really learn a lot about how to create courses and teach them effectively online. That's very, there very was money put into it. I mean, right now the estimate would be that they put about $20,000 per course into the, the first course that a faculty member teaches online. That's a lot of support. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and, we have already a first question, and uh, I'm going to uh, beam the questioner up on stage so you can see how this works. Mm -hmm. We have Tom Hames. Hello, Tom. Hello. Hey, Tom. <laughs> well, just for that, Hi, I'm going to do a special exciting display. Um, yes, uh, pardon the occasional peal of thunder. We've got a thunderstorm coming in down here in Texas. Okay, so if you knocked offline, we'll, we'll understand. I'll be, well, yeah, no, don't understand. Just sympathize. Uh, <laughs> I'll sympathize for sure. <laughs> yes, you will. Yes, you will. So um, one of the things that um, I'm very interested in and that I've, you know, spent a lot of time working on is, is, you know, to what extent does technology, particularly digital technology, allow us to rethink and break up the idea of courses in the first place, the idea of you know, what it means to teach and what it means to, um, uh, uh, what it means to teach and what it means to structure an education. Maybe it's teams of teachers and all this, this, this sorts of stuff that, you know, where space and time used to be a big barrier. One of the things we've learned with COVID is that that doesn't need to be a barrier in the same way anymore. Um, for instance, right now this week, I'm meeting individually with all of my students and I've, shut down I mean, they're all virtual anyway i mean it's online on a schedule um but you know i shut down my classes this week because i think this is a better use of my pedagogical focus this week to to sit down and, and have a real conversation with the students to see where they are 
um, to look at what they've done and and to give them a good push for the you know for the remainder of the semester. So um, the um, question I have is: To what extent have uh, these institutions you've looked at been able to systematize this kind of rethinking of what a course even means or credit hours or these sorts of things, which are a product of literally butts and seats. Have we lost Steve completely? No, I don't think so. Hang on. Can you hear us or just, because I see joined podium in the middle. No, he oh, just, there he is. Reloaded. Okay. <laughs> did you hear, did you hear the middle of that? <laughs> Steve, were you able to hear that? Uh, it may be that uh, that his phone is. I shouldn't have said anything about the storm coming in because I'm not the one who. <laughs> no, you jinxed, you jinxed us. I think um, I jinxed maybe, Steve at least. Yeah, well, uh, let me let me take a look and see if uh, if he's on here twice. Um, it looks like no. Uh, it looks like that's actually a, um, a frozen image. Um, yeah, Lisa's a strange. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Steve, there he is. Okay, okay. had to do it twice. Well, okay, <laughs> I heard the question, it's a great question. Um, I looked at five institutions, two of which were purpose built, uh, created right from the first days of planning, um, mm -hmm. to be exceptionally effective in uh, terms of quality access and in the case i'm going to talk about affordability was also a, uh, uh, an explicit goal uh, they, they in fact one of the first things they did in trying to conceptualize the institution was to decide what the tuition was going to be uh, and then they tried to develop an institution that could thrive at that comparatively low level of, of uh, tuition and that's what's called the College for America programs at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, they're the only one of the six which grappled with the questions that you just raised. Um, in fact, when they first started the program, the word course wasn't in their vocabulary. Uh, hmm. They were talking about competences to be acquired, projects to be worked on, um, sort of ancillary online materials uh, that students could use to get themselves ready um, and, and an overall competence map uh, that derives partly from um, the AACNU's uh, essential learning outcomes um, and partly from more job uh, oriented competences. What they discovered was that they, it was very difficult to articulate with a larger system of expectations on the part of potential students and the regulatory system to not have the word course there. So uh, they would bundle three projects together uh, that had related competencies um, and they would call that a course and award three credits for it. But that's the only overlap with conventional terminology. There were, mm -hmm. Students never met with each other online or face to face. The interaction was entirely uh, or virtually entirely student to supervisor, uh, student to coach, student to counselor. Um, and that really points out that the, uh, in terms of assumptions about quality and learning and so on, the big difference between College for America and the other institutions, the other five, uh, the other five uh, you'd find much more familiar because they have a big emphasis and in a lot of different ways, more even than traditional institutions, they take advantage of student-student interaction, students working in teams on projects, peer critique of one mm -hmm. another's work, debates, competitions, simulations. Um, uh, but if you're a competence-based institution, and aren't, you know, absolutely gigantic, um, you're giving up most all of the possibilities for student-student interaction, uh, which mm -hmm. is a really powerful engine for, uh, right, right. it's involved almost all the high impact practices that have been named uh, involve some form of student-student interaction. Mm -hmm. So the, 
the, the claims on quality for College for America rest more on the competence definitions, on the assessments that are being made of student competences, and the ability to um, ideally introduce stu students to challenges that they're just about ready to tackle. They've got to learn more, but not so much more that it would seem impossible to them. Uh, right. So it's a different kind of claim on what makes this kind of learning effective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, because College for America is kind of unique, and in, in my view, it was almost the best conceivable way to implement uh, competence-based education that was um, likely to have a claim of being effective uh, mm -hmm. in the same ways that these other five could be, because at least they had problem-based learning. Everything is about e working on a project and learning what you need to do to do that project, and the projects are made as, as real or realistic as possible um, mm -hmm. and as relevant to the students' work, because all of these students are employed, almost all the students are employed um, uh, by companies that are clients of College for America. So the College for America, among up, one of the other differences is they don't recruit new students, they recruit new employers. And then the employers make this education available um, more or less as a benefit. Students may have to pay something or the students may find that their um, tuition benefits from their employer completely cover the tuition costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, other, the other thing, the other thing I, was I was thinking, thinking about, about there, there was, was um, I mean, one of the big problems with the triangle is efficiency. And the big cost driver in most institutions, or one of the big cost drivers in a lot of institutions is the cost of faculty. Yeah. And how do we, you know, is there, are there ways in which we can make faculty more efficient than tying them to a 16-week course uh, with its ebbs and flows uh, and uh, in, in, in terms of, just the way the, the work is structured. You know, I find that as a faculty member, there are significant chunks of the semester where I'm like, yeah, this is a time when I don't really need to be involved in this. And I could be helping other students or I could be doing other things in the process so that I could be more modular too, not just the class. Because yeah. um, that's the, you know, we got to attack all of these cost drivers. So anyway, thank you yeah, for the answer. I haven't looked into that too much at Central Florida. But there might well be examples of that because so many faculty have had so many years of mm -hmm. getting experience teaching blended courses and online courses and developing materials that are useful mm -hmm. online uh, that they could well de facto be doing what you just described. I just didn't think to ask. I thought I think yeah. that's a good question. In the I've actually college, embedded a librarian in my course on my own mm -hmm. initiative, not institutionally. Great. And and she uh, tackles some of the research needs that the students have. And these aren't things that I can't do, but it's a load that I can take off my plate so I can focus on the things that she can't do. And uh, and she's physically, well, physically, digitally in my course and can be accessed by the students anytime. And she comes in and gives some guest talks over the course of the semester, too. But she's she's a, she's in my course as a teaching assistant. And that works quite well. I'd like to have more people like that and, and actually put together teams. And if we could spread out the workload, I think we could make the whole system a lot more efficient. College for That's America, just the German in me. <laughs> College for America, when it was designed, uh, originally they wanted a $3,500 a term tuition. Um, mm -hmm. They raised it some as 4000 They felt that they couldn't have a conventional faculty uh, with um, and do the other things they wanted to do uh, at that level. So um, they have sort of staff experts. They use a lot of adjuncts for different purposes. And by, when I say adjunct, I just mean somebody who's part-time, um, either doing this as part of or on top of um, another job. Some of them are specialized uh, as assessment people. Some are providing academic coaching uh, for student, mm -hmm. but right. I think it's one of the things that would be that really needs to be looked at closely uh, in the years to come is what are the trade offs of not having a faculty um, that has the responsibility and the education 
um, yeah. to guide this sort of the continual redesign? Is there, do you lose anything or gain anything by investing that in conventional staff roles where among other things, obviously there's no tenure. I think it's a team effort. I mean, it's a it's a combination of things, and I think you still have to have that that faculty member at the center of the universe. But so much of what faculty end up using their time for has absolutely nothing to do with their area of expertise, and in many cases, even teaching, uh, or at least not teaching what they really you know their areas of expertise. And so, it's more efficient in my mind to you know for me to have the librarian teaching research strategies or digital literacy, even though I can do that, she does it better because that's the focus of her inquiry. And we could also go interdisciplinary and have teams of English professors working together with government professors to teach you know, composition and writing in a political science context or something like that, where those, lo those loads are distributed out in different ways that I think would be really effective and would I think at the end of the day, if you structure it right, could drive costs down and accessibility. Um, but I'm eating up enough time. Speaking of of of, of uh, <laughs> accessibility, I want to give somebody else accessibility to the forum. Sure. Well, thank you. We'll make it more efficient for you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And don't get fried. Don't get zotsed. Um Steve, one one quick question. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, this one project ran into trouble because it didn't have course language. Um, mm -hmm. Who objected to the course lack of course language? Was that accreditors? Students. Uh, students. Essential students. Thank you. Now, they, they were shying away from something that was so innovative, they literally couldn't relate it to anything in their past experience. So the, uh, it was partly the students, I think the accreditors too, regulators, were expecting to see three credits for what? Um, mm. And if you think about it, the, the sort of the pure conception of competency-based learning has nothing to do with time on task. You know, for this credit, you may be, if you already had that competence, you can just put in a relatively small amount of time to demonstrate that you've got it. Uh, but in order to exist, with pre, uh, sort of exist comfortably with potential students, with employers and with regulators, having some way of saying competences, credits, time, but we're not going to talk literally about hours. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to make sure I didn't miss that point. Uh, and everybody, uh, this is, again, your, your time uh, to ask Steve your questions and to put forth your ideas as well. Uh, you saw how easy it is to ask a video question um, and also to ask a question by chat. In fact, let me just, uh, I wanted to hoist one, uh, one question that came up. Um, this was about uh, alumni, and let me make sure I can find the source of this. Uh, this is Kay Hampshire, who asked, uh, how do alumni organizations impact either positively or negatively this iron triangle of accessibility, quality, and affordability? I, I think it could go either way. I never looked at that question, so I'm just imagining it at this point. But uh, let me go back to a very basic thing, which is why do people think it's an iron triangle and why are they wrong? Um, the, the I think the intuitive idea is that quality is somehow related to the the quantity and value of academic resources divided by the number of students. So in that model of quality, you want to maximize the time, uh, which is one of those academic resources, faculty time, for each student. Uh, and anything about reducing that amount of time is somehow a guarantee of lowering quality. Uh, and one of the most subtle and most widespread ways of reducing time per student, of course, is to have more students. The problem is that that whole model is fallacious. That isn't the way that learning happens. Learning results from what students do uh, and only from what students do, uh, as Herbert, Herbert Simon once said, um, which means that you can have institutions that are have relatively small, comparatively small amounts of resources per student where the student learning is more effective than it is in institutions with larger amounts of faculty time and other resources per student. The National uh, uh, Survey of Student Engagement, NESI, 
uh, has some research that shows that to be true. Yeah. And uh, I think in different ways, these institutions uh, demonstrate that too. So it, it, it sort of requires uh, alumni that don't react negatively to um, uh, somewhat changed ideas about yeah. what a class looks like um, yeah. and who are supportive, um, um, first of all, financially. One of the things that I've seen for years, um, and I spent 20 of my years of my career as a funder, of innovations in higher education was that institutions would do some things that I thought were really spectacular in terms of improving the guts of teaching and learning in that institution. And then I would look at the, their websites um, and their ways of describing themselves, you know, the Wikipedia article about them to choose one small example, and would make no mention at all of what these pioneering practices were, which meant that they were depriving themselves of getting more alumni support, financial support, um, support in terms of alumni time, in terms of these uh, scaling up new practices. That's a real problem. I can see that there. Jen, that was a really good question. Uh, thank you for, for hitting that angle. We've also had several people asking a question around quality. And I want to bring up the one from, let's see, John Henry Stites, uh, who asked us, I want to make sure that we uh, get a chance to dive in. Um, your initial temporary guest asked how quality can be measured. How do any of the six institutions measure quality outside of time on task? Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful observation about time on task because um, I don't believe any of them do that. And yet um, that's, a, that's a nice evidence-based way of measuring quality is looking at time on task, uh, especially if you get even a little higher and say engaged time on task. Um, the institutions, I won't say they've got six different ways of measuring quality, but um, it's more than two or three. Um, Georgia State, for example, mm -hmm. thinks about quality primarily in terms of graduation rates. Mm -hmm. They started um, this journey um, with graduation rates that were about six year graduation rates that were about 25% and even lower graduation rates for uh, students for underserved groups. In fact, um, of African American students starting at Georgia State back in the late 90s, um, only half of them reached the end of their freshman year or started their sophomore years. Oh, man. So that their, their measure of quality and their measure of equity are related to each other. Yeah. If they're looking at the overall graduation rate. Um, and by the way, this is the assumption below this. I don't know if it's assumption or fact. Uh, the fact is that a lot of what Georgia State did was to try to improve teaching and learning. And so, therefore, a lot of the credit for the increase in graduation rates has to do with increasingly effective instruction, um, as well as some things that they did that are more, you know, student support um, or any kinds of steps. As much as possible, they were trying to improve graduation rates by improving teaching. So their measure was graduation rates of that. And their measure of improved equity was bringing um, the graduation rates of students from underserved groups to be the same as the students from um, privileged groups, more and more privileged groups, which they've achieved. Um, they're all the way up there. The black students and uh, Caucasian students graduate at the same rate from Georgia State. And keep in mind, a lot of people would assume if they're, especially in their, with the old model of the Iron Triangle, yeah. you would assume that anything that you could do to reach graduation rates for black students would further increase the graduation rates for white students. Right. So the gap would remain, but that's not what happened at Georgia State. White hmm. students' graduation rates went up some. Black students' graduation rates went up a lot um, after 15 years, 20 years of effort uh, to where they're now identical. 
That's fantastic. So that's that's one that's one answer to, yeah. to equality. And Governor State, and in a very different way, University of Central Florida. I think the um, their their definition of equality would tie more to evidence based practices, um, high impact practices, um, um, well designed ways for commute cumulative learning across as students progress through a degree program. That one is more governor state. The um, teaching and learning, effective teaching and learning practices being diffused, that's more Central Florida. And I've already mentioned College for America, which is competencies, and whether students have mastered each competence. Central, uh, excuse me, the College for America only has two grades, uh, if you want to call it a grade. Mastery or not yet. <laughs> uh, not yet, students can try again, uh, do something different, see if they can learn more and uh, demonstrate mastery the second time. Very different sense of quality than the other institutions. That's interesting. The, uh, the, the not yet suggests that kind of um, uh, asset based mentality, you know, and it's uh, <laughs> you know, you're on the way. I, I, that's that's true. That's true. I, I have no mastery of Korean. I am not yet. That, that is good. Uh, there was a, a follow-up question for this, uh, and this came up in the chat from a few people, uh, like Susan uh, Garbelman, and uh, they're asking about quality matters and wondering about the uh, QM. And hang, hang on one second. There's some discussion about QM. Uh, yeah, some QM fans. So, uh, yeah, uh, what do you think of the role of quality matters in this? Um, do these three institutions just not use QM, or is that something we should think about? Um, I know Central Florida is a participant in QM, and I just never looked to see whether the other five are. Um, I think QM, uh, the Quality Matters program, has played a really positive role uh, over the last 20 years in helping um, uh, institutions and faculty connect um, evidence-based teaching and learning practices with online learning. Um, rather than seeing uh, uh, online learning as a cash cow where the quality is as low as you can get away with. Yeah. Um, QM has really been running counter to that and um, they deserve a lot of applause for that. I will say modestly that the uh, one of the two funders that I worked for, uh, I think, as I recall, helped QM get started. Uh, and it's a great example of a small grant leading to a large scale long-term change in practice. Uh, QM has done a great job. Well, that's a that's a wonderful transition to the question I was going to ask. But before I do that, let me just say to everybody, uh, we've got about nine minutes left. So this is a great time for you to put forth your questions for uh, Steve Ehrman um, about, uh, about these issues. If you'd like him to dive into one of these schools more closely, if you'd like to address some of the uh, other different parts and pieces of this from uh, alumni and technology to accreditors, this is your chance. The, in fact, here, let me just make this even easier still. Um, the uh, podium here is open. If you'd like to just grab that teal colored box and, uh, and start talking. Now, while people are formulating their last questions, uh, I'd like to ask one of myself, um, which is in the futures angle. Uh, how can, you know, looking ahead, say, 10 years, what's a path forward for getting these innovative practices out into other campuses? Um, on, uh, on Twitter, uh, we have a, our, one of our Scots friends said, this won't, this won't happen. These are pools of activity, but the, but the overall ecosystem doesn't want to change. How can I prove him wrong and cheer him up? And how, how can we get these kind of uh, broken iron triangles out into the rest of higher education? Yeah, I call it rubber triangles to some extent because they're stretched <laughs> in three directions. Nice. Um, uh, it's not going to be an easy row to hoe, especially um, in this stage where, I don't know, at a guess, 10, 15 institutions. I hope I'm wrong about that. I hope it's more um, are beginning to make progress of this sort. Um, I'm hoping that one of the messages of the book will help, which is that it's likely that um, the large majority of institutions have made at least some progress in this direction, but they just haven't realized it yet. Um, 
And if they begin to see that they already have assets in place, things they've done either recently or things that are long-term uh, strengths of their institution, they may feel it's easier to take another little step. And that was one of the things that I learned from the four institutions that weren't designed from day one to, um, to be effective in these ways. Um, they started just by taking little steps, which over five, 10 years, they didn't see as being part of a bigger puzzle. Um, and when they did begin to see, oh, we're already part way, we've already had successes, we've already been seeing that it's possible. And now that we can see where we are going in a more holistic way, now we can really step on the gas. Um, and I think all these institutions had this sort of inflection point where they realized that they could try, they could aim their sights a little higher with some expectations that they would, that they would make it. So starting small, and then once you've done that successfully, then realizing it and saying, hey, we can go even further and then picking up the speed. One of the other points that I, I mentioned earlier in response to a question was the importance of boasting about what your institution is already doing. Uh, I think the more institutions that look at this analysis um, and realize how important it is to improve quality, not just access and not just affordability, but all three, um, and that they can do it already. There are things they're already doing that they can boast more about. I think that might begin to change the popular conception um, that's um, far too widespread these days, that college education is a commodity um, where you invest as little as possible, um, whether you are the taxpayers or people paying tuition or whatever, in order to get the degree, that it's the, it's the degree itself, not the education, that's what's valuable. Um, so ch seeing progress as being cheaper and cheaper and worse and worse uh, education, we've got to get that out of the way and have institutions boasting about not just how well their students are doing after graduation, but how that was directly emerged from the experiences that they had as students, what they were able to do, even in first year, to working on, for example, real and realistic problems and making a difference and then getting better and better at that um, as evidence, for example, in their e-portfolios. And a lot of institutions are uh, developing toward uh, programmatic e-portfolios, which is to say portfolios where the student semester after semester is adding to the evidence of what they can now do and what their intellectual capabilities are developing uh, to become. Um, there are a lot of potential ways in which we can begin to change the consciousness of the wider world, uh, potential students, employers, regulators, accreditors, uh, that we're already on the way. And if that begins to happen, then you'll, that's where you begin to see the, the neighborhood begin to flip. So it could It'll be, we're, wow. we're in the middle of that phase change now. We have to be patient. I mean, I think one of the biggest lessons for me, remember, Having come from a grant making background, um, I tended to see improvements in terms of two or three year time chunks. Um, mm -hmm. And people applying for grants tend to think about, well, you know, what can we do in this short amount of time? And then now we've got to propose something new, um, different uh, for our next grant. So, or the new provost comes in, or the new president comes in and said, well, you know, the only way we can make our contribution clear is to do something quite different from what's been going on. The institutions that I study are really marked by the continuity of effort, the cumulative building piece by piece of these larger constellations of institutional strengths that together improve quality, access, and affordability. So it's a difference in, in mentality about what you're doing. Um, and that takes years. To develop you know you can't pray say we're going to start years of patient effort today um it's much better to say we started years of patient effort about five years ago here's what we've done so far now let's keep going let's keep gradually raising our sites 
That's a that's a terrific answer, uh, and I I want to say something about it. But two questions just popped up, and I'll make sure people get to ask these questions. Yeah. This is great, Steve. Um, this comes from uh, Charles Finley at uh, Northeastern, and uh, Charles asks, "I wonder what role fraternities and sororities play in creating support and peer learning to achieve a quality experience for their members. They do more than just party." Uh, that's a question you need to answer fraternity by fraternity, I think, and sorority mm -hmm. by sorority across mm -hmm. institutions. Um, the institution that um, where I went to school as an undergraduate had a strong fraternity system, and um, the fraternities emphasized uh, academics. That wasn't the only thing that they were doing. They also were having the parties and so on. But um, one of their selling points to uh, potential pledges was look what we can do for you academically. Well, that's, that's a good, again, uh, Charles, that's a really good question. Um, and that, but it does break down at that small level. Uh, let's see if we can sneak in one more question under the wire, another good one. This comes from uh, John Becker at VCU. Hey, John. And John says, uh, CFA doesn't, CFA doesn't have great graduation rates. Does that matter in the quality conversation? That's a really good question. Um, in my, I don't know is the answer, John. I'm afraid the um, so many students are part time um, at CFA, uh, and virtually all of them are holding on, to, holding down full time jobs. So I don't think they could be measured by the same expectations um, as programs that are. Um, serving students who are, uh, uh, on the average, closer to working really full-time on things. And their competence-based structure, um, and the fact that they've torn loose from semesters, um, also, I think, um, if you want to say enables, encourages students to think more in task-oriented terms and less in when the task is going to be complete. You're aiming for mastery, so it took you longer. You can still hit it. Um, I think from the point of view of a College for America and, and Southern New Hampshire University, um, they would say this is an asset, um, that instead of students getting through in a minimal way and finishing up not really knowing very much, that their students, whenever they graduate them, will be more capable. Now, whether they are, uh, that's still you know, that's a long way down the road, uh, a lot of research, I think, and hopefully more programs than just the one College for America. It's, 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 it's strength and its weakness in terms of my um, collection is that it's, it's so unique. It's much more different from the norm than any of the other five. Even Gutman um, is um, much more like a conventional college than College for America is. Oh, oh. John, that's, that's a great question. Um, oh, and, and thank you for so many great answers. We're, we're out of time. Uh, we have to wrap things up. But I want to thank you not only for putting up with technological problems, but just for answering so honestly, so deeply, and so generously. This is a terrific book, friends. And thank you, Stephen, for joining us to discuss it. Um, let me, do people have my email? Because I want to. I didn't share that. Yeah, uh, did you, I'm gonna did you put my email in the um, chat room. I also want to, one thing that we didn't talk about um, that I think people would be really interested in is um, why is it so urgent for colleges to improve quality? That part of my book is on the Stylus website. Uh, in your um, PR, Brian, for this, um, uh, for this webinar, you include a link to the stylus page with information about my book, reviews, and, and so on. Um, it, there's a, a link where you can freely read chapter one, which is the chapter that lays out all the arguments for why is it so important to improve quality, why, in fact, is our quality level currently far less than we think it is, um, as well as the urgency of equitable access and the urgency of affordability. Well, again, I second that. Um, those were great links and, um, and you are a great guest. Um, we can, uh, 
we hope that your next um, your follow up for this, the next three or so case studies, whatever form they are, uh, we really look forward to seeing them. Uh, thank, thank you. you. This has been a great. I've had a great time, and I'm. I don't know if it, you can do this, but I'd be happy to stay online since I rob people. Of <laughs> oh, you didn't rob anybody. You were very, time. very good. Uh, I'm going to need to wrap up, but thank you. Thank you for your offering. We know how to find you. Yep. Uh, we, uh, friends, looking ahead, uh, I just want to mention that we have a, a set of, uh, of uh, topics coming up, including uh, more and in rethinking learning uh, on disability and classes on eco-media literacy. Uh, also, if you want to keep talking about this, like how to define quality successfully, what the role of quality matters is, the role of alumni, the role of fraternities and sororities, please tweet at us. Use the hashtag FTTE. You can tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events, or hit my blog for more conversation about this. If you'd like to look at our previous sessions where we've touched on different parts of this, including quality, uh, including affordability, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And we've got 275 sessions to choose from. In the meantime, thank you all so much for the really, really good questions and thoughts. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate your patience, your flexibility. We can only explore the future of higher education with all of you. And thank you for thinking of all of us and thinking with us. Until next time, stay online and stay safe. Bye-bye.